Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Brie Noble, and I am excited to be here today with Lindsay Kirkendall from Revolution. I love the name Revolution because it's like taking the industry by storm and not you know, accepting those those industry norms that people tell us, right? So we'll get into that. Uh, but before we do, I would love to have you let our listeners and, and people who are watching the podcast know, Lindsay, a little bit about your background, uh, how you came into working with musicians. We were kind of talking a little bit at the beginning, and I think we've kind of been in this for almost the same amount of time, which is really cool. So and we have a lot of similar ideas about the indie music world. So let them know just a little bit about how you got to where you are today. And, you know, just a little bit about your your background with working with artists. Yeah, absolutely. So I got to where I am today <laughs> because I grew up wanting to be in the entertainment business. I was singer and actor, a dancer. Like I loved all of it. I wanted to do all the things. Grew up in Southern California. I moved to Nashville in 2005. And as much as I loved performing, I'd actually had an opportunity a couple of times to work on the back end of um, some film projects uh, before I left California for Nashville. And I really fell in love with the business side. And so when I got to Nashville, I was very open to, um, you know, whether it was um, participating in the industry on the business end or participating in the industry as an artist, it was, I was open. And I also, you know, got into Nashville in 2005, just a few short years before the industry lost its shirt in 2008. So it was a strange time in the music business because everyone was kind of seeing the writing on the wall. And for someone trying to hardcore pursue an artist uh, tra career trajectory, all of the mentors or people that I was talking to at the time were still very much pushing the record label thing, even though I kind of had a sense that that was not really going to be it. Um, and then I met my husband six months after I moved to Nashville and about 10 months after that we were married. So it was also a big part of my story was just wanting to have a family and be a mom. And I think for many female artists, we really struggle with the timing of that when we're supposed to be like building this, you know, career as these young, beautiful, starlit pop star musicians, you know, and like, <laughs> yet so many of us want to have a family and, and be a parent and have a personal life. And how do you time that, you know, because you're supposed to be successful before you have the kids. And that was a big piece of it for me as well. And, and trying to solve that puzzle. And so I actually landed my first uh, corporate job on this, on the music industry side. And I always say, um, you know, I took that job because I was putting my, my husband through audio engineering school. And, you know, when you get married, it's like this light switch flips on in your head. It's like, now we have to make money, you know? And so it made a lot more sense to just go get a job in the music business than trying to pursue an artist career. Cause that was so amorphous and a job is a job. <laughs> so I took the job. And what I was telling you earlier, Brie was that job. It was, um, I was doing ad sales for a digital music magazine and they had lost a bunch of money from their traditional label clients because it was 2010. And, you know, as we mentioned that there's this huge shift in the industry in 2008 and everyone was trying to figure out how they were going to make it. And at the time, this magazine said, oh, I, we have a great idea. Let's sell ads inside of a digital magazine to independent artists. And Lindsay, that's going to be your job. <laughs> 
And I, it was terrible. It was a horrible ethical position to be put in because uh, I Okay. Did you know that this was what you were supposed to do when you took the job or did they kind of throw that at you? It was, it was part of it, but I didn't fully understand how little people were reading the magazine because this is a magazine that had been in print for 25 years and had just gone digital two years prior to me coming on board. And no one was reading digital magazines yet. They were way ahead of their time. Um, actually, I don't know if anyone reads digital magazines. I don't know if that ever took off, but that was the piece that I was like, what did I just get myself into? Because I couldn't in good conscience tell an artist to spend $600 for an ad that no one was going to see. And then on the other hand, I was noticing if independent artists are landing on my desk thinking spending $600 on an ad was going to really move the needle in their career. There's some gaps in education that Mm -hmm. need to be corrected. Mm-hmm. And so what I ended up doing was creating an educational resource as like a sub brand of the magazine and interviewed all my industry friends and started putting together just, again, an educational newsletter that that instead of selling to independent artists, we were growing an audience of independent artists. And then we were selling to advertisers that wanted to get in front of that audience. Mm-hmm. So I kind of flipped that script a little bit and made still was able to generate some income for the company, but doing it in a way that was supportive of the independent artist. And ultimately through that process, what I realized and learned was digital marketing (laughs) and how to monetize an audience. And so at the time I was going, Oh my gosh. And I had, we had other friends in various other industries that were growing really profoundly, you know, flush with cash businesses in the digital space. And I'm going, why aren't artists doing this? Anyone can now access their audience and they just need to know how to monetize them. So that was really what drove me because I was seeing an opportunity for artists to be in full creative freedom, financial freedom and time freedom and personal freedom by taking ownership of their business and learning the skills of, of building a business online and monetizing their audience. And then they were able to then do whatever they wanted to do. And they didn't have to be subject to, to the label. So to answer your question from earlier, I've been doing this kind of work for a little over 10 years. Cause through the course of building that initial product, um, there were many, many artists that would land on my desk and I would do marketing consulting with them. And then my husband and I eventually opened a business together that did that. And I worked for a record label. I worked for Sony in the radio department. I've worked in management. And so I've had a lot of experience working in more of a mentorship capacity with artists. And I've always found that this is the best way as artists, you know, in this era that we have to build businesses that really allow us to do what it is that we want to do with our art and not have to be subject to parental status, age status, you know, all the things, particularly for women that are very challenging as we build a career as artists. So, yeah, I mean, so agree. I, I started my career in earnest when I was 30 or 31, you know, and I had a child. So, and I just, like you said, like I had, first of all, I was never the young, hot starlet. That was never me. So I was never going to make it that way. But, mm-hmm. you know, once you have kids, it's just a completely different game. Totally different game. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I was thinking back to what you said about 2008. It really does seem like like the perfect storm for the music industry because, you know, iTunes had come out pretty recently and that was changing yeah. everything. And then, and then the 2008 crash and all that stuff, you know. And, yeah. and ugh, I mean, it just, it seems like that was just one of the hardest times for independent musicians, other than of course the pandemic, which is a whole other thing. <laughs> right. It's a whole other bottle of wine. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you, since you have worked with labels and independents, like what is the difference you've seen in, in mentality with, let's just say successful artists that are independent versus like artists that are on labels? I'm so glad you asked that. It's such a good question. I've never, I've told this story many times, but I've never been asked this specific question. So it's such a, it's really a great question. Um, And it, it was 
it was interesting because I went back to work for the label um, after spending a few years. Cause again, this was, so I worked um, or I left my, my music magazine job in about 2013. And like I said, my husband and I started a business and we did that. We ended up starting a business and having two babies in about a span of three years unintentionally. I don't recommend it. <laughs> it was not a good look for a couple of years there. Um, but we, um, we were working primarily with independent artists at that point. And I was really just so passionate about the opportunities that existed for independent artists. And I just found that in that kind of 2013 to 2016 era, artists were still having a hard time wrapping their mind around the possibility and the opportunity that really truly did exist. Now it's, we've come a long way in 2022, or I guess 2023, when this episode airs, um, artists have, have really come a long way in terms of really understanding what the possibilities are. So I was getting a little burnt out about 2015 of just beating my head against the wall, trying to help artists understand you are actually an entrepreneur and you're a business owner and you need to think like that. Right. And oh my I was, gosh, I started my podcast in 2015, the female entrepreneur musician. And that was yeah. like, my whole goal is like, you guys are entrepreneurs, you know, and now I feel like I don't have to pound that anymore, but that was right. definitely it in the beginning. Oh, for sure. And so when I had the opportunity to go to work for Sony, I was so excited because I went, yes, like finally, I'm going to be able to work with artists that get that they're a business. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I bet it didn't happen. It was almost worse. Oh my gosh. It was almost, I, in some ways it was because particularly for those that had been on the label and been in that system for a, such a long time, they really didn't understand anything outside of that context. And I, I remember sitting down with an artist that I developed a really great friendship with after I left that job and saying, look, you know, your primary, cause I kind of think artists fall into three different silos. I think there are artists who are songwriters at heart, you know, they're storytellers. I think there are artists who are entertainers at heart, like the Taylor Swift's the Britney Spears is like their, their musical talent isn't that like profound, but they're, they're entertainers, you know, they're just, that's how they, you know, exist. Um, and, and then I was, there's a third category and I'm totally blanking on it. Oh, the musician, like the artists that are really just like the technically profoundly gifted mm -hmm. musicians of the world. Um, but this particular artist was a songwriter. That was who he was through and through. That was his, real gift. And I said, look, and at the time, you know, the algorithm was a lot looser. This was like 2016. Uh, the Instagram following that he had was highly engaged. And I kind of showed him the numbers. I said, look, what if we put together a little like evergreen songwriting course that you could sell to your fans? And I said, if we even monetized 1% of your, of your engaged fan base. It wasn't even 1% of your whole number of followers. It was 1% of the people who were actually engaging and interacting with your content. And we charged 500 bucks for this songwriting course, which is nothing because people will spend thousands of dollars going to songwriting retreats. Yeah. They'll definitely spend 500 bucks to get to learn songwriting from their favorite artist. I said, if yeah, we they'll just... spend that at least that much on concert tickets. So to get oh, yeah. to work with their favorite artist. Yeah. Right. It's like a no brainer price point. And when I did the math and I showed him how much he could make, if we just monetized 1%, it was over $300,000. And he was like, okay, you have my attention. Right. But he was between management at the time. And he was like, well, I have to wait and see what pans out with this next management company, because where, whoever I go with, they're going to get 15% of whatever I do. Hmm. And I was like, Wow. Like that's not, that, that doesn't have to be that way, first of all. And second of all, it was just like the mentality of artists that have been in the label system for so long, they're so ingrained in that paradigm that they really can't see beyond what the label can do for them. And I think in a lot of ways, I'm not saying it's wrong for everybody, but I think in a lot of ways it hinders or like hamstrings their ability to do 
with their artistry, what they really want to do with it. Because at the end of the day, they're in a business system that is all about the bottom line because they have to keep the lights on and they have to keep the doors open and they have to keep their staff paid. And so the artist has to fit whatever they're doing into whatever happens to be working at the time. Mm. And that's not the true creative life cycle. Well, it doesn't allow anyone to be innovative. Right. Exactly. So, it's the opposite of innovation. It's why yes. on Top 40 Country, we have like 32 different male solo acts that all sound the same. And I can't believe that's still true after all these years and the whole salad gate and all that stuff. Like right? it's still like that, right? Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> well, so I, I'm just thinking about the whole management thing. Is this... Cause I have a client that has a manager and, and she's like, I cannot not have a manager or like people in the, in the industry that I come from won't take me seriously. Mm. Do you find that that's the case or is that maybe going away over time for independent, for artists that like maybe used to be in that system, but now they're kind of independent. I don't, I think that's a really good question. I think it frustrated me when I heard that. Because well, yeah, it frustrates you because you're a free thinker and you yeah. don't want anyone to be boxed in. Right? right. So I get that too. I'd be like, Oh, <laughs> if I heard that it would totally frustrate me too. Um, but I think it is really circumstantial. I think that there are, I guess I would say this to, to that statement. I would never want to encourage an artist to do anything in their careers to be taken seriously. You can be taken seriously just by virtue of the fact that you are a living, breathing human being that has value and your art has value. Drops mic, you know? Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> totally stop. agree. But she said that something like in that like segment of the industry, if she didn't have a manager, her agent would drop her, like her, her booking agent. And I'm like, that's terrible. Yeah, that's really? strange. That seems... Yeah. That seems like someone's getting paid on the back end or right. something. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't seem above board. It's and like there's fun. this web of people that like keep each other up. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I remember actually having a conversation. I have a good friend who um, does, he's a manager and he also has a business doing um, Spotify promotion. And it really, it's funny because like the more I learned about it, I was like, oh, you're a radio promoter. It's just that the program director is not a program director. It's a playlist curator, but it's the exact same thing. Like the spot, the playlist, you know, promoters are just developing relationships with the curators on behalf of the artist and hopefully getting a placement. Like mm -hmm. it's literally the exact same thing with just new tools. And so I remember we were actually talking about a client that I was working with at the time that was considering bringing him on to do some Spotify promotion. And I was saying, you know, when is it ever appropriate to spend gobs and gobs of cash to build, like to push streams? And I was like, cause I just can't get on board with the idea of independent artists spending tons and tons of money pushing, you know, streaming numbers just so they can get paid less than a cent per stream. Like that's a diminishing return. It makes no business sense, right? Who would do that in a normal business world? And he said, the only time that he's seen it really make sense is if an artist is at a certain level where maybe they're trying to leverage their audience um, into getting certain like venue bookings or mm. things like that. And so then, because, and again, like you have to be aware, Hey, you get that you're spending money for a vanity play at this point, right? Like yes. you get that that's what this is at the end of the day. And if you're okay with that, like it's not wrong. It's just, let's be aware of what this actually is. And so, you know, he was saying, you know, we have seen artists be successful, you know, spending a little bit of money so they can get their streaming numbers up. So then they can, you know, maybe book a higher paying gig or things like that. So it's still a specific strategy, but I, other than that, I have never seen it be beneficial to an artist to like do things just to look a certain way to some other segment of the industry. No, it's awful. I hate it. And, and but I, I mean, it. if there was an easy way and like an obvious way to get those people onto your email list, yeah. then it would be so worth it, right? Like even with something like TikTok or Instagram, 
you know, if you're working on getting those follower numbers up, at least there's a way from those platforms to to connect with those people. You can, you know, link in bio, get them on your, yeah. offer them something cool, get them on your email list or, you know, get them to DM you or whatever. But there's like no way to do that with Spotify. Absolutely. I know. And that's what artists don't realize. It's actually a really bad discovery platform too. There's really no good um, discovery. It, like the infrastructure is not set up for music discovery. So it's not, it's just not ideal the way it's designed. Yeah, I agree. I do. I think they have some great algorithmic discovery. I mean, I've certainly discovered some great new artists, but I have no way I'd have to like physically go to their website in order to get on their email list, which I have done on occasion, but that's like a lot of steps. It's a lot of steps. You have to really like that artist in order to seek that out. (laughs) Yeah. Or you have to like quickly, in my case, I'll like quickly Shazam something, Mm -hmm. you know, if I hear it out and then I'll add it that way. But by and large, you're right. Like there's no way to easefully discover. Well, how do you encourage the artists that you work with to market themselves? What do you feel like are the best marketing ta- techniques right now going into 2023? <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of old school because I think that the best things are the timeless things. And mm-hmm. that because here's the deal. <laughs> technology moves at the speed of light. Literally no one can keep up. And what's working now is not going to work in another, probably even two or three years. Um, Even, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, back in 2016, the algorithm was so loose. You could build an organic audience without really spending a ton of cash just by creating content in a certain way. And I think even as we've seen, particularly with Instagram, because that's the platform I'm most active on, just how it's trying to compete with TikTok and YouTube, how it's trying to compete with these other platforms. And so they're throttling traffic to force people to do things like reels. And we're always going to be in a state of having to play by their rules. If we're always looking at what's the flashiest new marketing tactic, right? So I always try to encourage artists to first and foremost, do a really, really deep dive on who it is that they, they are and what it is that they have to say Mm -hmm. and really helping them understand the value that they provide to the world by virtue of who they are as artists, because it's a weird thing as artists, because we're kind of, we kind of bridge the gap between product and service. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're not really in one camp or the other. Um, And so No one else in any other industry sells the person of who they are as the product. You know, it creates a lot of challenges when you have to be the product. And when you're marketing on social media and when social media demands that you share who you are from a little more like behind the scenes peak in order for the the marketing to work, you really have to get clear on who the hell you are <laughs> and what the hell it is that you're saying and offering the world and what your value is. So I always like to tell artists like, Hey, start by just identifying if you had to, um, if you had to describe yourself in three words, what would you say? Mm. And so like, for me, if I use myself, for example, I, I usually fall somewhere in like the vein of driven or determined loving and funny. So I know that, I, what people like to, um, what people like to glean, if you will, from me or what they're buying into from me is not my products or my offers or my art necessarily. It's really the fact that they're in the energy of someone who exudes those qualities. And it's a much more unconscious exchange that the artist is typically not aware of. And so that's my tactic is helping the artist become more aware of the unconscious value that they bring to their fans and start to communicate that in whatever platform they want to be on. Because I also am kind of like the person that's like, look, and especially if you're a parent, you've got limited time. Your priorities are different than a 20 year old that's single and childless, you know? And 
you can't be on every platform all the time. It's just exhausting, you know? So pick the platforms that really juice you, that you really enjoy showing up on, engaging on, and get really good at communicating your value and figuring out who needs that message most. Absolutely. I totally agree with all of that. Now I have a lot of people, well, it's not a lot, some people in my world that are just like, I hate social media. I don't want to do yeah. social media. Yeah. And I tell them, hey, if you're willing to get out in front of real people, yes, look way more powerful than social media. That's like 10 times, 20 times more powerful. Yep. And that's, if you're doing that on a regular basis, you don't have to do social media. What do you think about that? I, I love I love that because I think most artists have a mostly hate, hate relationship with social media, <laughs> myself included. I don't want to be on these things. I don't really, I'd rather be like hanging out outside, you know, not being with my face on a screen. But at the same time, I try to look at it from a standpoint of, you know, this is also the most opportunity and access that we've ever had in the history of oh, yeah. modern artistry ever. So I try to see the bright side of it. Um, but I'm with you. I think it's always so interesting because artists will get on stage and perform for people like it's no problem, but then they get terrified when it comes to showing up online. Um, so I, I'm with you. I like to point that out to them and be like, look, you're getting out in front of people all the time. Why is it so challenging to get out in front of people online, you know? And, and I also think maybe this was kind of where you were headed with that. I also would agree that getting in front of people um, in a live setting is going to, it's a quality versus quantity approach, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a more quality rich interaction and you're going to have a better opportunity to, nurture that fan into a super fan relationship than you do exhausting yourself, creating content like a hamster in a wheel, right. You know, for the, for the passive follower that eventually over time will finally maybe hopefully become a fan. So yeah, it's like I, comparing, I like you know, having a house concert with 30 people to playing a farmer's market every week and hoping people stop by and, you know. Yeah, that's a perfect metaphor <laughs> for that. That's a perfect metaphor. Yeah. I'm yeah a that just occurred to me and I'm like, that is exact. that's why it's so much more, you know, house concerts are so, it, you really create that deep connection and a lot of people become super fans if they attend a house concert with you. They're very powerful tools. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. Well, what would you say? Well, first of all, I did want to say what you were saying earlier about how you're old school. I'm so old school too, I would say, because artists come to me and they're like, well, what can you tell me about getting on playlists? And what can you tell me about uh, funnels? And, you know, and I'm like, yeah, funnels are great, but I'm like all about building it as a real business. Like I know that the music industry is different, but in many ways, it's the same strategies you would use to build any business. Right. Right. And I think musicians just think it's, it's different yeah. and, they, and they don't, they don't buy into the, we need to like build it like a real business. They're like, I need to know all like the secret tactics and, you know, and, yeah. and the, the shiny things. Isn't that interesting that it's evolved that way? Like it's so, I mean, it makes sense to me that it has because I mean, so if you think about like the modern recorded music industry has only been around for what, like a little under a hundred years. Mm -hmm. So no one alive today has seen a model. Like we weren't alive when Mozart was Mozart and, and there was the patron mo model, you mm -hmm. know, and they were the artists back then were supported by their patrons. We've never seen that contextually, so no one alive today that's pursuing a career as an artist has any context for it looking anything other than what the traditional music business model has shown us. And we all grew up watching the Grammys with stars in our eyes, thinking, I want to be on that stage someday, not really understanding that even, even the people who win the Grammys half the time, or maybe even more than half the time, that's bought and paid for. You know, it's, there's a lot of bureaucracy and politics that happen behind the scenes. And they're not making very much money a lot of the times too. And they're not. Yeah. Like, or they're in a bad deal. That's just mm -hmm. completely, you know, we could go down the laundry list of all these people who have gotten horrible deals and have 
worked their butts off and then walked away with literally nothing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm old school with you too, because I think that playlisting and funnels and all of those things definitely have their place, but you're not going to be successful as an artist or as anything in life if you're constantly chasing the newest, shiniest object. And artistry isn't meant, I mean, there's a difference. I don't know. Do you ever um, read Amanda Palmer's material? Or are you familiar with Amanda Palmer? I am familiar with her. I haven't read her stuff in a while. Have you ever seen her TED Talk? I don't think I've ever watched it. It's really great. I highly recommend, and for the listeners too, I highly recommend it. It's about 15, 20 minutes long, but she has this great um, portion where she talks about the difference between being seen and being looked at. Hmm. And she was saying, you know, celebrity, when or, or, or people that are, are celebrities, artists that are our celebrities, they're being looked at, but an artist is someone who is seen. Hmm. And you can't truly, I think every artist starts with a motivation to express through art because their, their deep desire is to be seen and accepted. And, and you can't fully be seen if you're not fully self-expressed in your art. And when you're trying to go the celebrity route, you are not able to be fully self-expressed because you are subject to the, the requirements of that business paradigm. And I always say like the traditional music business model, it's not really the music business, it's the celebrity business. Mm. So I think for artists in, in this day and age, it's like, dude, old school it up. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, and that brought, that brought up something place as they may. <laughs> that brought up something I was talking to a client today. Um, it kind of relates to branding, but as you said, like being seen, right? A lot of artists are very stressed out about having their music come out in a bunch of different genres. Like that's just how they're they want to express yeah. what they've got coming out of them. They just happen to express themselves in a dance song and a reggae song and a singer songwriter yeah. song and a pop song. And then it super stresses them out because yeah. they're like, but now my brand is all over the place and people aren't oh, going to yeah. understand me. Yeah. I know. I get that a lot too with clients. And I'm like, but that's why we go back to three words. Mm -hmm. Because if people come to understand that what they're buying into with you is, you know, I'll use myself as an example. If, if people come to understand that what they're buying into when they're around me, whether it's watching me do something live, whether it's participating in a program, whether it's just hanging out with me online, that they're getting, you know, determination and vision and, and humor and a sense of feeling loved, if they understand that that's what they're getting, then it doesn't matter what art I create. Cause they, they understand ultimately, like whether I show up as a reggae artist or a rap artist or a pop star or whatever, that they're still getting at a deeper level, what they need from me. And that's not to say that some people aren't going to follow a lot or fall in love with songs that fall into one genre category or another. But it is to say that when we have the ability that we do to, you know, do the marketing in, in our content in the way that feels in alignment to us, we drive that narrative and it's incumbent upon us to communicate like, Hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm about over and over and over and over and over. So the focus is not so much on the music. And then that gives you the, the freedom to play, but rather the focus is on what you're getting from my music. Yeah, rather. I agree. I think they're being told somehow. And I've heard this in like the Nashville world that you have to make your mark in a very specific genre. It's kind of like niching down, right? When we talk about in business and that you have to make your mark in that genre. And then once you have, and you've got this fan base, then you can play in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of agree with that. Like I agree with that in business. Yeah, you definitely need to niche down right? Like I niched down to working with women at first and then I expanded beyond that. I totally get that. But I also think that art doesn't come out that way. Right. You know what I mean? And so I think they're looking at like Taylor Swift. Okay. She like got really popular doing country. And then she was, as she got really popular, then she was able to move more into pop. And then she was able to move more into, you know, singer songwriter and stuff like that. 
And so John looking Mayer's at that kind of model. Example. Yeah. Yeah. What was and, that? Did you say something about John Mayer? Yeah. I said, he's another example of that. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And I, I think that I understand why artists feel that way because that's what we've all seen. Mm -hmm. We have not given, been given the context of, I mean, I'm sure like someone listening will be like, I can pull up an artist who was successful in all these different genres, but it's really not the norm. And, uh, and I think that that also is a decision that each artist has to make. Like, do you want to exist inside the music business's paradigm of how to grow a career, which by the way, if we're being honest, their success rate is like 1% of 1% of the people mm -hmm. that are ever signed have any real success. And then when we break that down, we go, well, what is success? Are we just characterizing that by the amount of money that they're making? Because would you call Whitney Houston a success or Britney Spears a success or Kurt Cobain or Jimi Hendrix or all these people that literally like lost their apart. life yeah. their freedom right. It, right. And to, to be a celebrity? Um, you know, and their art, Michael Jackson, great example, right? So it's like, okay, first of all, are they a success? Maybe, maybe not. Second of all, the music business's model only has a success rate of like less than 1%. In any other business or industry, they would have not made it. And yet all the artists are like, but this is how we do things. And it's like, no, actually the beauty of being an artist is that you get to choose how you do things. You don't have to do it in this way. And I think if I'm being really frank, I think mostly the artists that want to do it in that way are artists that really desperately want to be a celebrity. I think that is so true. And I think you, when you're thinking about, do I want to censor myself in order to keep myself in one genre, even though I feel like this art is coming out of me in another way, you know, you, you have to make that trade-off. Like, do yeah. you, do you really want that celebrity? Do you really want to become big in and known for one thing and you're willing to censor yourself or put yourself in a box to do that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. But if you are the kind of person, and there are a lot of artists like out there that are just deeply felt artists, right? They're right. not going to be okay with censoring themselves and they're going to feel frustrated and angry, even if they become a celebrity because right. they've been censored. And so you just need to, to do that deep work to figure out which one is more important to you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I remember my husband and I, even before we had kids, it was like, late 2000 it was like 2008 2009 era when duos were a really big thing mm. and he was like let's be a duo let's do it like we can do this let's do it let's be a country duo and i was like, <laughs> like you're gonna be a you know lady a now right yeah it was yeah. like and he's a brilliant musician and producer and we were we were writing material and doing some stuff and we had enough industry friends that if we really wanted to give it a go it we could have really made something happen. But I, I kept saying, I said, Dustin, I am a chick from Southern California. I didn't even hear country music until I was like 10 years old. Uh -huh. I like country music, but like, it's not in me in that way. I couldn't ever, I would never be able to feel fulfilled, you know, per, per charading in that way, just for the money. And, and there are sometimes, trust me, like where, you know, we've been on the struggle bus financially and I'm like, damn it, maybe I should have just done it. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, it was the right decision, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I love this. Con I feel like I haven't had this conversation in this way on the podcast ever. So this has been super oh, cool. Yay. I know. Um, so I just wanted to like get back to, let's get back to the money since we are on the Profitable Musician show here. Um what do you recommend when you work with artists as far as let's say they already have built like a, a a small but mighty fan base what are your favorite ways to help them monetize that so i like to help them first get a sense and we touched on this a little bit with the social media what are the things that you actually enjoy doing and and also look at that within the context of your actual circumstances. Cause that's a big piece that most artists don't really consider because the artist who has 
a wealthy family that's willing to bankroll their career or an investor is a fundamentally different career trajectory Mm -hmm. than a single mom who just got divorced and is living at home with her mom again and trying to get on her feet financially. So to try to put those two kind of artists in the same you know, pot and say, here's the the formula. Mm-hmm. It's just not reality. And so often when I'm working with artists that don't have, you know, an investor situation or maybe funding by family members, often we're looking at, okay, what's your second favorite thing? And I help them identify what are some other things that can be monetized? Because that's the other piece that's really tricky is that from a consumer standpoint, they don't know that we're not getting paid for our art. Consumers don't understand mm-hmm. that. And they don't really understand how to transact around music anymore unless it's a, a ticket for a live show. So we have to be able to put products and offers together that people intrinsically understand the value of. I don't know, Brie, if you've ever, um, I need to introduce you to my friend, Johnny Duanell, who does the climb podcast. Mm-hmm. He always uses the metaphor of a cardboard box. And he's like, if you walked up to someone with a cardboard box and you said, Hey, I'm going to sell this to you for $5, they would understand, Oh, I can use that, you know, for this, that, or the other, or they'd know if they even need one, if they're moving, maybe they are in the market for a box. Maybe they're not. That's really gray when it comes to music. Mm -hmm. So the consumer doesn't understand how to transact with you around your art. So we really look at so many different variables of the artist's life, you know, from, from circumstance to who are you as a person and what, you know, we do a lot of fun personality tests and things to kind of help them get a better sense of how do they show up in their day-to-day life? I can't just tell you to go create a business where you're going to be, you know, required to create copious amounts of TikTok content. If you're really a writer and you want to write blogs, um, you know, and so looking at really what juices you and energizes you so we can be more efficient in the offers that we create. So we kind of pull from all these different areas of an artist's overall person, if you will, um, to identify an offer that they're going to enjoy delivering on and that will get them to the number that they need to meet to start generating, you know, a full-time income. So I know that's really vague. But it's no, no, so- I do something very similar and I agree, like understanding the way they like to express themselves. Like, is it writing? Is it video? Is it now? Sometimes it's like, yeah, you don't like video, but you need to get over it and you need to do it, you know, but if you, right. if you love writing, then you can totally utilize that yeah. online. Yep. Um, and then, so, I mean, I think, I think that's easier once you've got somewhat of a fan base, right? Because then people are like already waiting for you to offer them something. They're excited Mm -hmm. about it. What do you do with people that are new that they haven't, you know, they have 30 people on their email list or whatever they're, you know, they haven't gotten that snowball to the top of the hill yet, but yet they still need to make money. Yeah. That's the hard one. It is a hard one. It depends on how new, Um, because if they're at least able to still go out and play shows, then we can still, and that was one thing I was going to mention, you know, when I'm working on creating offers with clients, it can be something as traditional as like a custom show that they're doing in homes or at sororities or at nonprofit organizations and finding, you know, those venues that maybe are a little atypical. So it's not just the slog of trying to get into the same old bars and venues that are just going to ask you what's your draw, you know? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so we look at, you know, sometimes doing things that are more tr- traditional in that way, all the way to things that are much more non-traditional. So I, I mentioned, you know, the single mom, I had a client in that exact same situation and her second favorite thing was she was really passionate about helping women who wanted to birth outside of the hospital system and do home births. Mm. And she had a lot of experience and knowledge in that arena. So we created, um, an opportunity for her to take a group of women through like a guided eight week, um, program to support other mothers who were considering, you know, birthing at home. 
And we did it specifically. People are like, how the heck does that relate to music? Well, it doesn't necessarily, but what it does is it still builds her an audience one it, and two, it allows her to create something that's going to generate a high amount of income in, in short amount of time. And I know that you know this because you create digital offers and you understand like the goal is to get like that passive income happening with things that are not demanding a high amount of your time. So you can have the time to go do the art. So with people that are new and are just starting out, you know, we focus first on maybe finding that opt-in, like you talked about too, like, how can we just start growing the audience? Sometimes it is a matter of, we just need to pour into, to building the audience. And I have a couple of clients right now who are in a space where they are really doing a lot of work of, of changing the minds of their audience. So there's mm -hmm. not a lot of like easy point A to point B sales. They're really kind of in the space that quite frankly, you and I are in Brie, like we we've had to do a lot of education of the yes. artist community to get them to be like, okay, I know what you're talking about now. Now I can make an educated decision. Let me, on let me educate you so I can educate you. I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I've got some clients that are in that space. And so sometimes it's just, a, it, you do invest that time up front to, to get your audience to a point where they understand what you're selling and they can make that purchase. And sometimes it's going, Hey, if you need to make money right now, like in the case of my single mom client, it's like, what can we monetize that you also love? I love and that. I love that. The second favorite thing. That's really cool. Yeah. Like because the then from framework. there you have a audience that even if they don't love your music, if all of a sudden you come out and say, Hey, I'm, I'm releasing some new music. They're at least going to be curious. Mm -hmm. And you have a captive audience that you have their email address, their, their numbers, whatever that you can start, you know, pushing your music out to those people. That's interesting. So let's say the money isn't the problem. Maybe you you've got a husband that works or like you said, parents that have given you money or whatever, you know, I've had different clients in those kind of situations or that you sold yeah. your house and you had a lot of money in the bank or whatever. Yeah. Um, would you then also recommend that they kind of build another thing on the side like that? Or would you say just go all in and build your music audience directly? Oh, that's a good question. I, I always fall back on, well, it's case by case basis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it depends on what's the goal for the artist. You know, I, um, I had a client one time who was, I think she was in her mid fifties. She had a couple of teenage sons and her husband was an attorney, you know, they did well. And she, she always said, our, our deal was that my husband was going to support us for the first half. And then I'm going to support us for the second half. So he can go to Sherpa school. <laughs> <laughs> And so she was looking at, and she'd always, you know, she'd sung in church and she had done house shows and done a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and we were looking at building um, more of like a subscription box thing for her. Um, and, and she was also kind of running a, a small group of people who really wanted, like her, she was very faith-based. So she was kind of doing something that was more faith-based with a, a group of people that wanted like a mentorship kind of thing. Um, but she also utilized her music to support that. So she was taking songs that she'd written to support the theme of the topic that she was, you know, counseling or mentoring this group of people through, and they were paying to be in this, this container, this experience with her. Um, but all of that to say, you know, she, um, she was kind of the breadwinner at that point. Mm. And that was a very unique situation. And then there's some people that, that are like, well, we do have the money. And like, I know for my husband, um, that's a big goal for us is to get our income to a point where he can take like a good six months off and only focus on doing the projects that he wants to mm. do in his own artistry. Um, so I think again, like it's so, it's so hard to say, cause it's just such a circumstantial thing, which I think is just another one of the unique nuances of building a business as an artist that no one really talks about because we're all so focused on needing to look a certain way. And this is how you grow and this is what you do. And this is how much money it costs. And it doesn't really have to be that way. I mean, sometimes you can totally grow an audience doing something over here in left field, but guess what? Now you have an audience. 
So if you start releasing music to that audience, sure, there are going to be some people that might not care, but chances are at least a good chunk of them are going to be a built-in fan base for you right away. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, just like, you know, right now I'm working as a work, worship director at a church. Yeah. And yeah, it's music, but it's like a completely different thing than like me performing my own stuff. But yet a lot of them have become fans of me and purchased right. CDs and, you know, gone to my Spotify and all of that. Right. Yep. And none of them had ever heard me perform any of them, any of those songs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it speaks to the fact that at the end of the day, people are buying into the person of the artist, mm -hmm. because I think artists, we are kind of a special population. We are these kind of divinely inspired <laughs> creatives that, that want to be fully expressed. And, and most people are naturally drawn to people who are confident, who can stand up on stage and sing and perform and want to self-express. Like that is just a natural thing that we all have. And so I think helping the artist community understand that, hey, what you're offering your fans goes so beyond the just the music. It goes so beyond just the product. It, it's a great service for you to share with your fans who you are, your perspective, how you see the world, what's meaningful to you, because we are leaders of our own mini movements in a way. And that's really what people are buying into at the end of the day. And it's funny, I'll ask clients, maybe you do too. Hey, who's your favorite artist? And then I say, they name three things that you love about them. Usually they don't even mention the music. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they will. And if they do, it's usually at like the number three level. But I'm like, do you notice that you didn't mention their music at all? And they're like, oh, wow. Yeah. And then I go, so, hey, let's let's play this game. If that artist was a total asshole, would you still like their music? <laughs> and they go, ah, I don't, I, you know, it like trips them up because they're thinking about it. But it gets people thinking like, oh, yeah, actually, I do often buy into the person of the artist and what they stand for versus the specific song or the genre or, you know, what they create. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So this has been such a great conversation. I have loved this. I have one more question before I let you go, but this is one that's like a pet peeve of mine. So I'm really curious about your opinion. Sure. You know, in the non-music world, when we're out there learning marketing and digital marketing, we get this thing hammered in us of figure out what problem your person your has and then figure out how to solve it. And yeah. this drives me nuts because music doesn't really solve problems directly. Yeah. You know, and whenever I say this, artists are like, yes, it does. Like it, you know, it, if they're sad, it makes them happy. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not really directly. Right. Not and, and the consumer isn't thinking in that way. No, they're not like, I really need a happy song now. Or, you know, yeah. or I, I need to listen to this particular artist that I've never heard of before. Right. You know? Or they're not even self-aware enough to go, mm, I'm feeling sad right now. Yeah. I need a song. They right. don't think if I'm feeling sad, they, they might reach for a chocolate bar. I was going to say ice cream. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before they'll go, mm, I need a song to pick me up, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know, I just feel like, you know, musicians that go and kind of, you know, go outside of the people like us that are educating musicians, they're out there, you know, learning Instagram or, you know, just generalized marketing from other people. They're hearing that and they're like, I don't even know how to apply that to anything. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's really bridging a huge psychological gap for artists to think in that way. Um, because I'm with you, it doesn't solve a direct problem. And that's why I feel like the way that I have found to communicate it most easily, <laughs> that was not even an easy way of communicating that <laughs> <laughs> stumble over my words while I'm trying to communicate something easily. Um, but the, that's why I like the three words idea. Mm -hmm. And I, I like educating artists on, Hey, it's actually incumbent upon us as a community to educate our consumer and our fan and our listener of the value that we provide. 
just by virtue of who we came into this world being, mm. because that is the magic, right? It's, it's great that we're able to also put that into song and it's great that that's the product, but even if we lost our voice or we lost our hands and couldn't play our instrument and we couldn't create art anymore, we would still be us and people would still be magnetized to us because it's who we are as artists. And so we still, and, and there's still a compulsion for most artists to share a message, to share something that is within them. And so even, like I said, if you lost your voice or you weren't able, able to play an instrument, you'd still have that in, internal drive to share with others and so I think, again, it's incumbent upon the artist community to get really comfortable with sharing the value of who they are. And that's hard to do because we all, as artists, the, the other side of that coin is that the artist community is also a very sensitive community. I know, so right? We have probably like traumatized. And yeah. yeah, we have all these hangups and we have all this like, you know, humility and like, you know, self-doubt and criticism and all this stuff. And now we're expected to have to tell everybody why we're so freaking great. And also I think the people that aren't artists don't know that. Like they just they think, well, obviously if they're able to get up there in front of people and perform, they must like not have any insecurities. Yeah. But we're some of the most insecure of the lot, you know? And so I get the challenge there like that. That is a huge challenge. But I also think it's kind of beautiful because it's forcing healing in mm. the art community as well. And I think that's pretty cool. Yep. Oh, love mm. it. What a great way to end the show. Well, I would love for you to tell everyone listening and watching how they can connect with you on social media, your website, all the things. Yeah, absolutely. So I primarily hang out on Instagram. So you can find me at Lindsay Kirkendall. It's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y and K-I-R-K-E-N-D-A-L-L. -L. And yeah, I'm I'm in Instagram primarily. So that's the best way to connect with me. You can DM me. I offer a free consult. So if you would like to learn more about what I've talked about today, um, you absolutely can hit me up and we can make that happen. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's great to meet another like-minded person in the industry. I love it. I can't believe after this many years, I we haven't actually met. So I'm really I happy. Know. I know. We've known about each other for a long yeah. time, but we finally got to have the conversation. So I'll have to thank Evan for that. <laughs> for <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing everything with everybody today. Thank you for having me, Bree. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.